India is the story of loneliness. Despite the millions of people, Tamils, Bengalis, Hindus, Brahmins, Sikhs, streets full, cities full, a subcontinent full. India, land of the great Mughal and the sacred cow, land of thousands of gods and 10,000 temples. With high expectations, they went there, the young, dynamic adventurers of the Golden Republic of the Netherlands. One year before the foundation of the Dutch East India Company, the VOC, in 1601, the first Dutch ships arrived in the harbor of Surat. They were two merchants from Zeeland in search of trade and profits. But they didn't get far. The two were captured by the Portuguese and put to death. Not a very good start. Shortly after, the Dutch East India Company, which was based in Amsterdam, began to dispatch merchants all over the world. And laden with wealth, they would return from Indonesia, Ceylon, the Caribbean, Siam, Taiwan, Japan. The Amsterdam warehouses were overflowing with exotic goods. But there was one chunk of Asia which still had to be explored, India. Around 1615, the VOC decided to send out a fleet from their Asian headquarters in Indonesia, which could benefit enormously from trade with India. Thirty-year-old Peter van der Broeke was put in charge of this enterprise. He had picked up a lot of experience as a merchant in Africa, Persia and Arabia where he had organized trading posts for the VOC. Van den Broeke cleverly maneuvered the small fleet through the many islands and up the Indian Ocean, heading for the Arabian Sea. On the way, they passed Ceylon, which was still in the hands of the Portuguese, but would soon become the scene of another Dutch power struggle. Van den Broeke was a smart, cheerful and sociable type, a hearty drinker and good with people, not only with his own men, but also with the natives of the various outbacks where he had carried out his difficult tasks, as here in Surat in India. Unlike his unlucky predecessors, Peter van den Broeke received a warm welcome in Surat. In those days, Surat was about the most important port in the western half of the Indian Ocean. As a giant warehouse, it acted as a hinge for the entire Asian trade. Persian, Arabic, Turkish and Armenian merchants had been doing business there for centuries, and the Dutch just had to try and find their own niche. The main interest of the Dutch was the rich variety of Indian cotton, which was brought down to suit out from the country. With bribes, and smart trickery, our bon vivant van den Broeke managed to wrangle permission for a trading lodge in Sudat. Within the walls of this lodge, a handful of Dutchmen led an isolated existence, more or less exclusively dedicated to trading. For them, 
the outside world of immeasurable India remained a complicated and utterly bizarre mystery. The great Mughal, the Indian ruler of the entire area, generally resided in Delhi, a city which was devastated seven times in the course of the centuries. There, the sandstone red fort still stands, dating from the time when the Dutch came to India. But depending on the season, or on the Mughal's whims and fancies, the entire court, women, valuables, elephants and all, would be transferred to other cities. So when van den Broeke wanted to see the Mughal, he had to go to Agra. And there he also got permission to build a lodge. Prospects seemed so good here that van den Broeke wrote to Amsterdam that Agra might well become one of the best milk cows of India. The only problem was that it was a far cry from Agra to the coast, and that the merchandise had to be transported by camels and ox carts, which could take as much as two months to reach Surat. This meant that no one could possibly keep control on this remote trading post, so that everybody was able to do as they pleased out there. The first person there to do very much as he pleased was Francisco Pelsert, a gregarious drinking man who lined his pockets with illicit private deals in precious stones, and above all, in female slaves, young Indian girls of whom he selected the prettiest for himself. Pelsert was a notorious womanizer who even seduced the wife of a prominent Indian prince to secretly spend the night with her at the lodge. But when he wasn't paying attention, she took a gulp from a bottle of clove oil, thinking it was Spanish wine. And a minute later, she was lying dead in bed. The next day, the whole of Agra was in commotion. Pelsert was terrified, for every Dutchman would undoubtedly be put to death if they were to find out at the court that the lady had died at the lodge while committing adultery. But in his panic, Pelsert had been clever enough to bury her in the garden in the dead of night, and she was never found. A somewhat more stately grave was given to the great mogul's favorite spouse, who died while giving birth to her 14th child, the Taj Mahal, a mausoleum in white marble on which 20,000 men labored for 15 years. It was touch and go, or they would have had to build another one of those, one in jet black marble for the Mughal himself. But the Mughal was dethroned by his beloved son before his plan could be carried out. So they stopped at one. Or did they? A few hundred yards away, there appears to be another, albeit small one, not in marble, but in the rather less expensive sandstone. Nevertheless, its shape looks remarkably like the illustrious Taj Mahal. It is the mausoleum of a Dutchman who is waiting here in this impressive tomb for Judgment Day. Underneath this stone lies Colonel John William Hessing, who was born in Utrecht, Holland, and somehow ended up in Agra, India. 
Here he entered the service of the Great Mughal, and as the military commander-in-chief, apparently excelled in the art of war. When he died, he was given this princely grave. It's the size of a three-story house, but in Agra, it stands completely unnoticed. Which, of course, cannot be said of the world-famous Taj Mahal, drawing thousands of sightseers every day. Dutch ships plying the Indian coasts for new trade openings did not overlook a single product, not even narcotics. For that, they came to the old town of Hooghly in India's eastern armpit and conveniently close to the notorious Opium Triangle. After some negotiating, a fine lodge was built there. And after some additional speculation, the Dutch swooped down upon the very lucrative opium trade. This has been the only known occasion where the VOC embarked on such a large-scale narcotics trade. The opium was not meant for the European market, but exclusively earmarked for Southeast Asia, China in particular. Actually, the Chinese themselves were fierce competitors in the opium trade. With Turks, Arabs, Armenians, Jews, and countless others, the Chinese had always pulled a string or two in the commercial life of India, export and import. One of the most peculiar Chinese products ever imported to India is undoubtedly this cumbersome device, still known as the Chinese fish machine. Everybody seems to be completely clear as to his specific task amidst this tangle of bamboo, timber, stones, ropes, and nets, which needs 20 men to handle. But the astounding output of this mysterious contraption may well be no more than one single fish. A century before the arrival of the Dutch, India had been the domain of the Portuguese, who had not only found a rich source of fortune, but also a flower bed of millions of pagans, asking to be seeded with the Roman Catholic faith. St. Francis Xavier, famous missionary of Japan and Indonesia, landed here in Goa in 1542, armed with missile and cross. He converted thousands of Hindus, and then sailed out to bring his glad tidings to China. But he died on the way. His body was brought back to Goa and buried there in the Bon Jesus Cathedral. Goa was the main stronghold of the Portuguese in India, heavily defended by fortifications such as this Fort Aguada. It remained in Portuguese hands for over four centuries, even if practically all other coastal areas had come under Dutch authority. Next to the Bon Jesus Cathedral stands the Episcopal Palace, where a young Dutchman was employed for six years as the bishop's secretary. As a sideline, he covertly studied the secret sea routes of the Portuguese and espied a lot of other useful information. His name was Jan Hauchen van Linschoten. He usually got his information from sailors in transit. And one day, he happened to meet a fellow townsman on the quay of Goa, the famous globetrotter Dirk China. And he told Jan Hauchen of the exotic worlds of China and Japan. In his turn, Jan Herchen expressed his contempt of the Portuguese. They are vain and pompous brawlers, given to snuff and velvet cushions. They are inveterate whoremongers, 
who seek their pleasure with the female slaves. Even in the 17th century, India already counted hundreds of millions of people. Those days saw the beginnings of countless Dutch settlements, especially along the coasts. They were populated by small Dutch communities, more or less locked up in their own forts. And it could take many months before a Dutch ship would appear on the horizon. They were indeed lonely amongst the millions. This certainly goes for the VOC employees at the Coromandel coast, where the Portuguese were bombed out of their last strongholds. Here, the Dutch had a trading post or a fortress almost every 30 miles. Fort Heldria and Fort Narden were the most beautiful ones, but nothing is left of them. However, the old Fort Sadras Patnam has more or less survived, though damaged by age and battles. There's the old Landward Gate, for instance, still flanked by two Dutch cannons. Merchants have written about their lonely and isolated existence in these forts, where playing backgammon and drinking arak was the only way to pass the time, and where a vicious breed of white ants devoured everything. Clothes, books, papers, socks, shoes, yes, even the chests and the doors of the house. Sheer boredom and frustration drove more and more Dutchmen to make their own private deals and line their pockets by unlawful means. And so these official elephant mounting steps might be used by a thieving company clerk who in an unguarded moment would mount the back of an elephant to find some Indian who would be willing to exchange the goods he had embezzled from the storehouse for jewels or precious stones. Another important place in the Coromandel was the town of Masulipatnam, where the Dutch were doing very well for themselves, until the VOC started to introduce drastic financial cuts. They economized on the clergy too, only one minister for the entire Coromandel. But one Sunday, this minister had a very distinguished visitor come to his church. It was the King of Golconda. The king arrived with a retinue of princes and courtiers, all dressed up and stuck out with jewels. The king was smoking a pipe, which no one dared comment upon. He asked the meaning of the word amen. God's will be done, they told him. And the king nodded and said, that is fine. 
What is this book of laws, he asked, pointing at the Bible. When it was explained, the king bowed to honor the Bible as he would the Quran. Then the king inquired about the Ten Commandments. At the Sixth Commandment, he gave a scornful smile, saying that it was very bad for a man to be restricted to only one wife. The minister quickly pointed out that the idea was that a man should never interfere with the wife of his neighbor. Aha, said the king, that is different, that is fine. But undoubtedly the most compelling sob story from the lonely Coromandel is the one about young Johann Krauf, who died of love like a real Romeo. A colorful account by a contemporary doctor tells us how this Johann Krauf lost his heart to the charming, witty, and beautiful young Miss Katharina von den Briel, only daughter of the assistant merchant. After a few months of conversing and canoodling, he had coaxed Kate into giving him her hand, provided that the wedding would be postponed until a more convenient moment. Both were very much in love and could not bear to be apart for a minute. All he wanted was to be with his betrothed, while she would turn a deaf ear to any other suitor appearing on the scene. All she wanted was to see herself united with her Krauf. But alas, the green-eyed monster cruelly spoiled their bliss. One month before the wedding day, a man arrived on a ship who remonstrated with Krauf on the shady morals of his beloved and professed to know, giving chapter and verse, that she had already bartered away the most valuable treasure of her chastity. Krauf's love turned to hate. In fact, he took it so hard that he fell ill with consumption. In critical condition, he was taken in by his fiancée's mother, a kind and gentle woman who nursed him for weeks. And in the same house, under the same roof, lay the girl, for she too had fallen ill with grief, but felt so insulted that she refused to speak to Krauf. Softly but silently, the mother would tiptoe from one room to the other, nursing the irreconcilable lovers, the bride, Delirious and weakened, plagued by fever and bitterness, was the first to die. But just before she passed away, she had one lucid moment, and this is what she said. I am dying, and I shall account to God for all I have done in this life. But I appear before his face, as pure and virtuous as I left my mother's womb. Then she died, 21 years, one month and 18 days old. The whole town turned out for her funeral, and she was mourned by everyone, as she had always been so kind and cheerful. And when Krauf heard what her last words had been, he became desperately distressed and mortally ill. On his deathbed, he begged the girl's parents for forgiveness and to bury him by her side. On New Year's Day, Johann Krauf died and was at last united with his bride underneath this stone. A lover and his maid lie buried in this ground. Their ardent wish it was to be forever bound, but cruel and brutal death forbade this earthly bond. First von den Briel demised, then Krauf was doomed to die. Their bodies linger here to rot and putrefy, but God will join their souls up in the great beyond. Elsewhere in India, the Dutch had discovered that a lot of money could be made on indigo, the blue dye from the indigo plant, which fetched a fortune on the European market. But in the Coromandel, the main issue was cotton, linens as they were called. These textiles were produced by weavers' families with age-old experience. 
the Coromandel produced everything from rough cotton materials to the most refined silk fabrics with elaborately woven patterns and designs. The Dutch housewives only got the simple tablecloths and curtains, for most of this wealth of Indian textiles went to Indonesia to be exchanged for spices. Another part was destined for West Africa, where these fabrics could pay for thousands and thousands of slaves. Next to the old Fort Heldria lay the small town of Paliakata, which is now called Pulikat. It was manned by the overseer, the chief merchant, the military commander, a surgeon, and 125 soldiers. It's all gone. But in today's Pulikat, one is struck by curious structures. They are the tombs of Dutch merchants and soldiers. Time and again, they would beg to be released and to be allowed to return home after years of loneliness and boredom but most of them were only released by death. Behind this gate, which is never locked, one doesn't find the devotional silence of the graveyard, but a kind of easy-going microcosm of Indian life. <laughs> but despite all this coming and going, this is one of the best preserved genuine Dutch colonial cemeteries in the world. Amidst the graves of merchants and slain lieutenants, women are dancing peacefully for a good harvest. But in the Dutch period, in some parts of India, the same women were lord and master. The women were the hunters, the warriors. The men worked the fields. Succession only existed in the female line. And a woman would only put up with a man when she wanted a child. In those turbulent days, the Dutch had to fend off some really exotic opponents, but these women must have been the most terrifying and brutal warriors they ever had to face. <laughs> While the Dutch were entrenched in their trading stations, plagued by the inhospitable climate and the subtle torments of princes and competitors, outside the gates, Indian life went on as usual, as it had done for centuries. The ordinary man, the Hindu, just ignored the Dutch, who were only one of the many foreigners in his country. He didn't understand why they didn't understand that he could not always keep an appointment 
because he had a ritual washing to go through, or because, astrologically, it was not the right moment, or simply because he had to gather the fish. Also, the Hindus' sacred books, holy places, festivities, temples, and gods remained an inaccessible world to the Dutch. In Holland, they had only just gone through the iconoclasm, raging through the churches and destroying anything remotely resembling the image of a saint prophet or divine symbol. After that, they had got used to the austere emptiness of the Calvinistic churches. But here, in India, they were confronted with an abundance of temples and sculptured images of Shiva and Vishnu, Menaski and Durga, Arjuna and Bhagavati, the Dutch were totally baffled. One of their clergymen wrote, nobody must think that these people are like animals, not knowing of any God or religion. These pagans do indeed recognize a God, but pagans they were. The Dutch concentrated their attention mainly on two coastal regions, the Malabar and the Coromandel. On the Malabar coast, they waged a downright war to get the Portuguese out. Apart from commercial interests, they had strategic reasons. The Dutch were afraid that the Portuguese might try to use the Malabar as a springboard to recover Ceylon. One small fortress, survive this turmoil of battle unscathed. It is now the oldest European building in India, a Portuguese fortress built more than a century before the arrival of the Dutch. Goa was the last stronghold where the defeated Portuguese sought refuge from all directions. But in 1636, Dutch fleet started an impenetrable blockade, which was kept up for almost 10 years Eventually, Goa became so cut off that it seemed no longer necessary to conquer it. But elsewhere, one city after another was captured from the Portuguese and permanently occupied by the Dutch. Quilon, Gran Canur, Barsalur, Vengorla, Calanore. After heavy battles, they all fell into Dutch hands. Why were the Dutch so keen on having the Malabar coast? Because of the pepper. Pepper is the bride that everybody dances around, as they used to say. And these backlands of the Malabar had the best and the richest pepper crops. In order to lay their hands on this pepper, it was necessary to conquer Cochin which is surrounded by spits of land and fens known as the backwaters. At Cochin, the Dutch fought their last big battle for the Malabar. More than a month of grim fighting and persistent cannonades from the fleet finally made a breach in the wall through which Dutch commander Reiklof van Goens could make a triumphant entry into the city. The Portuguese attempted a counterattack, but in the nick of time, the alarm was rung by the Jews, who had been living there for ages, but had been cruelly persecuted by the Portuguese.
Before the Jews, the Dutch had come as liberators, with whom they developed close bonds, which proved profitable to both parties. These close ties between the Dutch and the Jews were symbolized in the Pardesi synagogue, for the floor has not been covered with a traditional desert sand, but with 1,100 blue tiles from China, brought down especially for the synagogue by a Dutch ship. In charge of this operation was a Jewish merchant employed by the Dutch East India Company. His house is still there in Cochin. A house which couldn't be more Dutch, with a Dutch doorstep, Dutch window shutters, Dutch ornaments, and a typical Dutch door. This house is now the residence of Sato Koder, the great, great, great grandson of the merchant who brought the blue tiles to Cochin. The Jews came to Cochin soon after the destruction of our second temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. And uh, after arrival, the Jay had no persecution or any, any trouble until the Portuguese arrived in, in the 15th century. The Portuguese tried to destroy our, partially destroy our synagogue. And uh, only when the Dutch arrived in, in Cochin, after de defeating the Portuguese, the Jews were um, free from persecution and the, Jew, uh, the Jews, Jewish community of Cochin main, maintained contact with the Dutch people in Amsterdam. The Jews breathed a sigh of relief, but for a short spell, the Portuguese felt the whip of undiluted Dutch rage. Portuguese property received short shift, as did nine of the 12 churches. The St. Francis Church, was stripped of all its religious luster to match the Dutch reformed Sunday service. Later, it was even restored by the Dutch, and later still, the gravestones of the VOC employees were bricked into the side walls of the entrance hall. The whole city was reduced in size to make it easier to defend. Everything outside the ramparts was demolished, except the dockyard. The only Indian prince who remained kindly disposed towards the Dutch was the Raja of Cochin. And no wonder, for Dutch cannons had put him on his throne. His palace was restored by the Dutch, who didn't fail to add their own personal touch. That's why it's still known as the Dutch Palace. Some charity was done too. Within the walls of a monastery, the little flower convent, we find the coach in Lazarus House, now used as a school. It had been built by the Dutch 
as a refuge for lepers. But in Cochin itself, the Dutch were soon leading the lives of sleek colonial burghers, gradually enriching themselves, as everywhere else, with private deals. The management of the VOC were really beginning to resent the fact that India was yielding less and less profits for the company and decided to dispatch a special envoy, Hendrik van Rede to Drakestein, to put things in order. He soon learned that no profits were forthcoming because all the VOC employees were too busy lining their own pockets rather than doing business for the company. An easy matter. For one single bag of pepper fetched a whole year's salary, this widespread corruption was sending the company well on its way to the grave. Von Rede to Drakenstein took the matter seriously. Like a tornado, he whisked along the Indian coasts, leaving a trail of penalized and dismissed VOC employees. But as soon as the storm died down and Van Rede was out of sight, they all simply went back to their old ways. The deep-seated habit of corruption was well beyond recovery, despite Van Rede's fervent efforts and despite the handful of the faithful who didn't yield to temptation and remained loyal to the interests of the VOC, like the virtuous couple Mr. and Mrs. Wolf. Unfortunately, Van Rede died on the way to Surat to stem the evil there as well. With a lot of pomp and circumstance, he was buried in Surat, mourned by thousands of Indians who had held him in high esteem. But the tornado wasn't mourned by everybody. Many VOC employees, from Clark to head merchant, immediately continued to act like parasites on the company's back, evidence of which can still be found in India. Far from the crowded Fort Cochin, the Dutch governor had a magnificent villa on an island in the backwaters. Many of these villas were built by the VOC executives, chock full of luxury and valuables, all paid with money from illicit deals. It wasn't for nothing that later the letters VOC were said to stand for Vermin of Corruption. By the end of the 18th century, the Dutch started their final exodus from India. The VOC couldn't handle it anymore. Supply routes were too long, lack of people and lack of means, the cancer of corruption. India itself became mixed up in a chaotic succession of wars, and the British, as the rising power, cleverly turned this to their advantage. India became the India of the British, but India mainly remained itself. The millions are still there, just as they were in those days. And so are the sacred cow, the gods, the temples, and the traditions. There is a dance performed exclusively by men. 
The facial makeup alone takes more than three hours. The dance itself may last for many days. India has all the time in the world. A small part of this dance portrays the bee, the honey, and the flower. Persians, Jews, Chinese, Turks, Arabs, Portuguese, Dutch, and British have trodden on Indian soil, leaving their traces. But they never touched more than the periphery of the Indian soul, like a bee taking some honey from the flower and moving on again.